Hi. Uh, it is noon on Wednesday, and uh, this must be Writing Wednesday. I'm Janet Fitch, and uh, I do this every Wednesday at noon Pacific, uh, answering your questions about writing, about the writing life, about man, God, and the universe, um, craft questions, uh, bigger questions, personal questions. Um, we do it all. Welcome. And uh, today I am up in the mountains, a um, uh, couple hours uh, east of of Los Angeles, uh, Idlewild, where um, uh, the, they uh, Meredith, uh, what was his last name, uh, wrote the Music Man, and Earl Stanley Gardner um, wrote the uh, Perry Mason series. Was up here in Idlewild, and they have a pretty famous. Uh, art school, high school up here um, that used to be called Isomata. It was a summer camp, and I knew people who went to that, and I never went to that because I wasn't an artist in those days, um, or at least in my family, it was not considered <laughs> considered such. Uh, so I went to regular old camp uh, up here, also in the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, I love the mountains, and um, I'm staying in this crazy... Uh, in that has um, every its theme theme rooms. There's a wonderful hotel in in uh, Central California called the Madonna Inn, which is a big hotel, and every room is designed very differently. It was built by contractor, and it's uh, it's quite a wacky landmark. And uh, I've I'm staying at a place that is sort of like a mini Madonna Inn. Uh, I'm having such a good time. Oh my! How wonderful from Zambia. Good to see you. Um, it's um, it's just a trip to stay in places like this uh, uh, where people hand build something whimsical. Uh, very fun. So um, it's, I thought I would talk about today, I thought we'd talk about place, a sense of place and what gives us a sense of place. Um, Hey, Miranda. Hi, everybody. Um, it is so good to be somewhere else because it reminds us that uh, place is so much, you know, is so fundamental to human experience. And when you write, uh, your characters being in a real place, a real feeling place, makes your reader feel like they are with your characters. They are in a place. And often, People will read a book just because you deliver on place, that you really take us somewhere. I think a lot of people who read mysteries read mysteries because they're set in a certain place and uh, they give you the feeling of, of traveling. Certainly historical fiction needs to do that as well. But all fiction needs to do that. The human being is a physical creature. And we need to be somewhere, um, not just an escapist thing, although escape is great, um, but to feel it's real. So landscape, in general, makes the reader feel that um, your story is real because it's set somewhere real and you can move through it. Um, I got up this morning and uh, sat outside my... my uh, significant other is a late sleeper. So I sat outside and, and just took some notes. You take notes of what you see, what you hear. Um, there are two wonderful applications that I uh, recommend. One is Merlin, which will identify birds by their calls, because I never see birds. I just see, I just hear them. And it's out of Cornell, um, uh, and they, you can just download on your phone and record whatever you're hearing, and it'll tell you, you know, what you're hearing. I, I heard, evidently, like eight different species of birds this morning. Um, and then, how do you describe bird call? How do you describe the sounds that you're hearing? How do you, you know, um, sound is really an important way of establishing uh, place. 
because it's dimensional. You can hear something far away. You can hear something close by. You can hear something behind you. Um, it, sound will establish dimensionality. So right now the wind is in wind in the trees, um, not right up against the building I'm at, but maybe a hundred yards away. You can hear the uh, roiling. You can see them. It's certainly it's sort of a boiling. But the important thing is to sit there until you get the language. So it's not enough just to notice. You have to notice and then you have to find the language to record things. So it's you can't just say wind. You know, wind doing what? And then you have to have vocabulary and it takes a while. You have to sit there and say what does it sound like? Does it sound like a like water boiling on a stove? Does it sound like um, you know somebody whistling through a keyhole? I mean just sit there until you get something interesting on that sound and then what do you hear up close? What do you hear far away? What do you hear intermittently? Like we're on a mountain highway so I hear motorcycle, there's a motorcycle there. Motorcycles, I heard a tiny burst of like not quarter, like not even quarter to nine, you know, like five to nine, it was a burst of traffic. So that's like rush hour up here. It's like five of nine <laughs> to nine o'clock. Um, how do you describe sounds, developing that vocabulary? How do you describe color, uh, you know, cold, hot, you know, Think about if you were a painter, how would you paint that mountainside? Hi, Susie. How would you paint that mountainside? How would you paint that um, that madrone the madrone tree that's outside our window? It's got a um, a serpentine stripes of mahogany red, reddish brown up the gray uh, trunks. Um, and it has little round leaves uh, and tiny pink flowers. And um, it gives a dappled effect, both the, the light and shade and the twisted branches with the two colors on them. You know, you have to notice things so that you can write about them. What is the crunch of somebody through gravel outside a hotel room or a cabin door? You know, you can tell. Or things dropping on the roof, probably acorns, um, rattling down the roof, um, learning to characterize sounds and then get them into your uh, notebooks, you know, sense notebooks. So you can either do it just your visit to some location and just the sounds, smells, colors, uh, what's in the distance, what's close by. Um, that characterize that place. What is the smell of forest in, um, you know, late May, on a, you know, on a weekday morning? You know, I smell the, you can smell the hot pine, you smell coffee, you smell, um, what is a little bit of a rubbery smell? I didn't know, I don't know where that came from. Um, you know, listen and just really fill out the central details of the place you're at. Um, another app that I'm sure everybody uses is Google Earth or Google Maps where you can follow, you can actually enter a location, you can scout it out, you can go down the streets in Google View and see what, you know, what, is, what does it look like on trash day? What is it, What does your location look like? Um, house by house, uh, what do you notice about the rhythm of the of houses next to each other? Um, it's um, you know you they always say it's not what you know, it's what you notice. And uh, so many of us get uh, so many writers get so fixated on their story that they don't. Uh, remember to build a world. It's something that um, mystery writers and science fiction writers, fantasy writers, never forget. They never forget to um, 
to build a world. But people who are writing in the realistic world, for some reason, often forget to describe where they're at. You know, it's like it takes place in midair. Um, try to, you know, describe what you're seeing, hearing, smelling, feeling the textures, um, so that somebody from Mars could read your book or read your story and have a good idea of what what it is where you're at. You know, what what's life on Earth like in, in the physical body? Um, I uh, recommend Google Street View, especially if you cannot travel to a location that you're writing about. You know, you can get as close, you can get amazingly close when I was writing my Russian Revolution books, especially in Petrograd, but also in some of the smaller, you know, towns and villages. I used Google Street View, I used Google Earth all of the time, so I could be as close to being there as I could possibly, uh, as I could possibly get. Um, so you're looking, you're always looking to find something interesting to say about what you're seeing. So you can't just say there were trees, there was traffic, you know, a tree grew outside the window, but you're always looking for the interesting verbs or an interesting image that you've never heard of before. Because if you've heard of it, then somebody else wrote it and you can't write it because it's already there. Um, so Miranda likes the background. There is a buffalo. See the buffalo? <laughs> and then this uh, beaten uh, metal tin ceiling. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this place bears some description. It's, uh, uh, the room is like a screaming traffic island, ye uh, yellow with black trim. So uh, every room has its own pattern. And it's good to have your own, you know, every location that you tend to use um, in your uh, book should have a color scheme so you can so that the reader can picture it in their minds. Um, I have a character who's um, in my current book who's um, designed a uh, a, old, um, a room for her mother in uh, in a an old folk uh, assisted living. We can't even say old folks. We're getting there too. <laughs> um, in a retirement uh, home and. Uh, it's a strongly salmon colored room with touches of yellow and green and green carpet. And, and that salmon is grounding me in that room. I really see it uh, because of there's a salmon colored wing chair. And uh, from then on, that will have a feel of that place. Uh, you know, each character should have a color that they wear or color that seems to be around them. Uh, each location should have a, uh, a color scheme that helps, helps the reader put that together in their minds. Um, I, uh, you know, every place should have a scent. I mean, every place does have a scent because scent memory is uh, the strongest association with um, scent. You smell something and it puts you, it just crosses time and space and puts you right, you know, exactly somewhere. So if you have a character whose house smells of apple cider or spilled beer or old cigarettes, or cat litter, or uh, violet perfume, or, uh, you know, then that it wafts into our kind of mental space that will be associated with that, that location or person. Um, any, you know, you can just decide arbitrarily, or you could imagine what the characters 
living situation is like? You know, do they have four cats? Dog? You know, do they have, uh, you know, do they burn things in the fireplace? Uh, do they cook? Do they not cook? Uh, all these things are, are really helpful. And if you are scouting a location, um, try not to make assumptions about what it smells like because that's usually borrowed material. It's usually gotten it from somewhere else. So what is a, um, um, yeah, Ruthie is, uh, uh, every time she smells cigarette smoke, uh, she remind she's reminded of her father. Yeah. Um, it's all, all always, there's a cliched, cliched smell, especially when you get into hospitals slash prison slash uh, retirement home slash um, clinical environments. You know, really think about what, if you could go, go and be curious rather than just like, ew, it smells bad. Or assuming that, that, that every retirement home smells of urine and... Um, and uh, pine salt. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's something else it smells of. You know, it's good if you can get in and actually do that investigation um, and discover that uh, that they don't use pine salt, you know, to discover that it smells like a powder, baby powder, or it smells of turpentine, or they're painting that room again because there's a turnover. So it up. Uh, Maybe it smells like paint. Um, you can make that up. It's better to go and investigate. Um, but even in, in, in making it up, if you come up with something you've heard before, try to set that aside and ask yourself, what else could it smell like? Either, you know, in addition or instead of. Um, it's much more interesting. Um, smells, sounds... Um, Sounds tend to be not as cliched, but people don't look for the verbs. And so the verb, that's where your work is, is finding a verb for that sound. You hear the birds t cheeping and twittering. Um, it's nice to know what they are, so you can look on your Merlin app and go, oh, that's an acorn woodpecker, or that's a, you know, white-crusted nuthatch. But can you characterize the sound? Can you find language to tell us, not automatopoeia, you know, but actual words that describe that sound? It's a test. And something that's very helpful is to read bird books as they describe. And then can you describe what you just heard? You know, I got a robin this morning, you know. And it's it surprisingly, um, what did I say about the rock? I'll just go do this for you. Um, I got a peeper and a whistle triller for the robin. So I could easily say, you know, the, the whistle of the morning robin, um, the two note down step. It's a trill. I don't know what that bird is, but I can find it out. Um, the uh, acorn woodpecker has a crowish call in and it's vocalized both in the in and the out breath. Uh, and it sounds like help, help, help. That's kind of neat. I, I could use that. Um, uh, and then, you know, you put those in sounds and you can use them, you know, if you want to have mountain, you know, a section of what mount, what the mountains smell like, sound like, you know, et cetera, you can do it that way. It's so helpful to be able to go into your notebooks when you're at home and say, gee, I, you know, I have this mountain scene half a year later, um, but I can go and have a sense. What was that breeze? There was a breeze. Oh, end of May, it was on the warmish side uh, by nine o'clock in the morning, 
but there was this delicious, cool breeze that you could just bottle. It was so gorgeous. Um, how can I keep that for next January or three years from January? So you keep them in the notebook so that you can find them again. Uh, Miranda says, it's. I think that building a setting can also be helpful in making certain characters stand out or intentionally seem out of place. That's really good. Um, and uh, Ruthie says, it's interesting how we're getting so formal with our language, retirement home. Um, it depends on, you know, if you're using it in your work, it so much will depend on character, what the character's attitude towards something is, what their vocabulary is. Do they call it an old folks home? Do they call it a retirement village? Do they call it... Um, my mother's new life, you know, do they call it the place, uh, the character that I have that's going into the retirement home and is not happy about it, call, just calls it the place. Like she can't even deign to call it anything. Um, uh, having a name for it, you know, creating a name for it gives you a flavor, you know. Um, so what else can I tell you about place? Place is all about also layering. So you don't just want to describe things at a distance. You, you want to be able to move from distance, or like we call the master shot, to a middle ground, to close up, what you can touch, the character can touch, and then move out again. The, the reader believes that your, um, your place is real because you can move from, you know, eating, eating something, which is the hand is the actor, it's that scale, like a tabletop, to the room, you see the clientele of the restaurant or whatever, to hearing something outside. So there's something outside the room sized or have a window so they can see what's going on outside. And then as you move back and forth between the scales of landscape, that's when your reader really believes that your scene is real because you can move freely from the small to the, to the large. Um, and uh, definitely sound is dimensional. Um, smell is very so particular. Touch is something that's very that has to be up against the body, so it's very intimate. Um, something that's cold is it cold? Is it hot? You know why don't we? You know we read books and we don't even know if it's cold out. I mean that's so primal. You know every animal knows whether it's cold or not. You know, <laughs> but somehow we forget to put that in the book. Um, Miranda says, I love when I'm reading a book and there are descriptions of a setting changing over time and a character recalling how it used to be. Yeah, there's a wonderful um, uh, scene in, what was it? It was something I used in the Point of View weekend that just passed where a character, it's in present tense in the present and then goes, oh, it was The Hours by uh, Michael Cunningham, and the, the Clarissa character is shopping, and then goes past an area where she was, she was a young woman um, and remembers what had been there and the kind of life that had been there. It's very good. It's really interesting. He handles that, that very well. Um, you know, car trips, how does, you know, how does the landscape change? And then how do you establish your character in physical proximity, you know, in physical being? So on a car trip, what's out the window is like, shoo, shoo, shoo. but in the distance, things don't change that fast. So the, the Black Eyed Susans are whipping by, but in the distance, you know, the mountains are, 
very much the same and the haze in the air. Is there fire? You know, was there a dust devil? What's, why is that haze there? You know, but that stays stable and then what's closer is moving fast. And then maybe I have the window down. It's a good idea to have the window down. And so the, um, you know, you can run your hand through the breeze. You can, you feel your hair tangling or uh, your bug just went in your mouth or there's so much that could be happening if the window's open. Plus there's a, you know, radio, if you're playing the radio or a CD. Plus there's somebody in the other seat maybe that you're, who's having a conversation. All, you know, and it's all the car trip. So it's about blending all those elements that makes it real, makes it real to us. Um, so if people are planning a travel this summer, I, I use a notebook like this. Just an artist notebook so I can write and I can draw because there's something to be said for not taking photographs for taking for taking the time to draw I draw terribly but I want to capture what the outdoor kitchen at this place is like so uh, it's not that the the drawing is be, is a better source of, of information than a photograph it's that a drawing no matter how lousy you are um, you, it takes so much longer to make a drawing. And you sit there and you look at things. And the longer you look, the more that you use observation, uh, the more you're gonna get out of that landscape, even if it's a terrible drawing, it doesn't matter. Um, oh, this is... Uh, um, Uh, a, a, a Zunaid is talking about a, um, a, a scene from Painted Black where uh, after uh, the main character after her boyfriend's suicide drives to her to his mother's house and just sits outside and using all the senses I even let her peel an orange I think uh, so we have that extra smell in the air um, uh, just I try to pack the senses in there because I think the reader craves them. I think we all crave them. I think we are so sense deprived in our current reality that um, we are desperate for sense information. And uh, it makes a memorable scene. It makes a, a scene that, that people can envision. Um, so while you're chasing down your story and trying very hard to make make it, you know, all those elements where the dramatic elements work. Don't forget physical reality. Um, it will uh, just add such dimension to your work. And, uh, you know, it's not instead of drama, it's not instead of other things, but it's, it's what makes it real. Well, what else can I tell you? Um, I, uh, you know, times of day, you know, what's the difference between eight o'clock and nine o'clock? What has changed? What's the difference between six and 6.30 in the mountains? You know, I noticed last night they were at, like uh, on the mountainside as the, as the sunset behind me, Shadows rise up the mountain until there are just a few things picked out in light, including there was like an island of trees that just caught the sunlight and then everything else had already fallen into shadow. And that would, that would be something I could use all day long in my fiction, uh, that, that island of light, you know, as the shadows are rising, you know, that last clinging to what is bright. Um, well, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, hi, Malika. Malika said, I've heard that place-based stories are hardest to write, 
nonfiction, though. Any idea why? Place-based stories are hardest to write. Well, you have to, you're giving the reader a sense that you know what you're talking about. And so you either have to know a lot or you have to see a lot. And you have to see and have the vocabulary to translate that into language, into onto the page. You know, people A don't observe very well right now. You know, we need to slow down and really look at things and notice things and notice more things and know to take the time. Most people don't have that kind of time, you know, but we were writers and we've taken that on and take the time to really notice and then reach for language. So maybe the first thing you get is a cliche. You've seen that before. Cross it out. What does it really look like to you? What does it look like? What does the Madrona look like with those satiny uh, trunks with the twisted mahogany bark over the gray bark? You know, it looks like flames rising, actually. There's just... So you sit there and sit there and sit there until you get something useful. Um, uh, Malika just read Emma Klein's Los Angeles in Granta from Best American and liked it a lot. Oh, that's interesting. I'll take a look. Um, you don't need a lot of breadth. You don't need a huge swath of territory to describe. You know, it's more about being in one place and going this way, going out with it in your mind. So what does what you're seeing suggest to you? And how would you describe it? What do you know about it? Um, very useful. Um, what else? You know, the kind of music that, uh, you know, that you hear in the air. You know, what goes by? Is it, you know, uh, what's in the car? You get into the car with somebody, you go through their CDs, pick something, and look at the, you know, the range of CDs and maybe put something in and, you know, what kind of feeling do you get? What? How does that singer's voice sound? You know, what's unique about that voice? You know, doing a lot of work on the senses is is essential to this. What else can I say? Yeah, so especially as the weather starts get, getting better, just sit outside and see if you can give a complete sensual picture. I call that doing the weather. You know, do the weather, meaning start with the weather. How does it feel on the skin? Um, what do you see, hear, smell, unique to this time of day, at this date, this part? place in the season this, um, and get used to really noticing and then reaching for the language um, it's it seems like a no I hate to say no brainer it seems like something we would always do and, and but we get so involved in the um, characterization and story that often it's a third draft where you remember, oh yeah, I didn't like really describe the room. You know, this, this doesn't have to be done first draft. This can be done at any time. Uh, but the more you keep notes, the more you do it as a practice, just the way artists sketch. It's always sketching, you know. So do you think time and place should be named? Signposts is what an editor had called it in nonfiction. You think time and place should be named. I don't know how they wouldn't be named. You know, if I have a scene in the mountains, I mean, I can rename the town. You know, I can call it Potter's Town. Um, but I want to say that it's summer and that it's, you know, it's unseasonably cold. Um, 
uh, her nose was running, you know, or had to wear a puffy coat. I'm glad she brought it. Uh, what birds are there uh, early in the morning? She, you know, no, but people aren't up yet. You know, the crunching of gravel or whatever. Um, I don't think you always need to use the actual location in fiction. You know, I tend to fictionalize things that I use a lot and then use the actual things for things I don't use very much. You know, if I set a scene in a bar, I'll I'll make it I'll make up a name for the bar and I usually will combine things in my mind. If I'm just passing a bar, I might name it. Um uh, I tend to fictionalize like a street name that I have this a house on that street, but I will not fictionalize a, a street I'm driving down, you know, uh, to place the reader. Oh, I'm on Wilshire Boulevard heading west, uh, right about Fairfax. I wouldn't make up those names because it locates us in a city. But if I have a house, I might not put it on a named street because then people who go there, just like the bar, people who go there, people who live around there will nitpick you. Not that readers are nitpicky or anything, but people who know things tend to be, you know, if something isn't isn't quite the way they know it and you've used an actual location, you're going to hear about it. So I tend to fictionalize that part. Um, I know a writer who injured his thumb badly, so typing is out and he can't take notes. Do you have suggestions for things to do to improve writing? He injured his thumb, so typing is out and he can't take notes with a pen, like this. Um, then you're into you're on to on to voice recording. You use your phone, you use a voice recording, and then if you can do it, you can get someone to type it out for you so you can put it in your notebooks. That's a tough one. Um, here is a question um, that just came up. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, from MJ. Hi, MJ. Use of characters like Nurse Ratchet, one leather chair in the lobby, styrofoam coffee cups, empty carafe, coffee creamer, pellets, faded pamphlets. They call the place Silver City. Yeah, sure. And the more specific and unexpected you can get, um, the more people remember. You know, if it's a generic situation, you know, you have styrofoam cups, maybe you have the, you know, the junk mugs that you get from Goodwill that would say, you know, happy birthday, grandpa, or if that's a mental home, or you can say, um, you know, if it's a mental hospital, you know, saying uh, um, something ironic, something that comments on where you are. Um, you know, Viva Las Vegas, and there you are in the lockdown. <laughs> um, Meredith says, it's also interesting to think of how different characters would see and feel a place differently, like in a braided POV story. Yeah, you know, if you have, say, characters out in the suburbs, and you have one person who just loves leaving, home, leaving work, getting home, and that feeling the smell of the watered grass, the feeling, the neat, you know, neat little house, waving the neighbors with their boats in front and looking forward to his boat, his own boat going somewhere. And then, you know, maybe somebody else in that braided story sees it as a trap. You know, I'm working to pay for this, you know, so that I can drive and work and pay for this and drive and work and pay for this you know somebody else could be um you know restless teenager on their bike just trying to get out you know trying to get out of that suburb so yeah it's a, a place is something that is really description of place is something that really depends on the character who is seeing it whose spin is it 
So taking your own notes, that's your spin. But don't forget to do it because you will get stuff that you can use uh, um, in other parts of your life. You can use them in stories. You can use them in novels. Um, you don't know where it's going to go. Let's see if I got anything this trip so far that's, that would be useful. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> the room we had been in had a round bed. <laughs> that was very funny. It was a John Waters, uh, uh, a John Waters tribute room, and it was a great room, but it had a round bed, and I didn't realize. Well, who would have thought the round bed, when it's worn, tends to resemble a cup or a shallow bowl. So if you have any kind of uh, back issues or <laughs> physical issues, that makes it for a very tough night's sleep. Uh, my husband ended up on the floor. <laughs> so now we're in this one, has a regular bed. Um, uh, that would be something I could use any time, you know, to have people check into a room with a round bed and really looking forward to that round bed and discovering that it's... Um, a challenge, you know, physical challenge <laughs> to use it. Things that look different than they feel are really interesting. Um, just texture, things, textural surprises like that are really interesting. Um, any kind of peculiar peculiarity about a place uh, makes it stand out. Um, voice to text app for the person with the bad thumb, Lisa said. Good idea. Um, people who dictate their fiction, uh, that's interesting. I, um, I know people who do that, and uh, it's an, kind of an interesting way to get a, you know, a first, especially if you're working on a scene that's been hard to get into. You know, try, try doing it uh, voice to text and then at least it gives you something it gives you a handhold and then you can kind of back into the story that way um, you know we build up resistance and anytime we have other tools uh, they can come in really handy whether or not you have a broken thumb or not so to play with that is really interesting um, So Zunaid was saying as a 14-year-old in South Africa, um, reading The Horse Whisperer um, and fell in love with Montana by his handling of place in the book. Yeah, I think of all of, I mean, some people have said that all, who said it? Maybe Dostoevsky said that all, all fiction is fiction of place. That that place should be part of everything, that people are, and I dealt with that, uh, you know, in White Oleander. I actually have dealt with it in all my books, that where the place that grew you, um, that you're as much an emanation of that place as the place is, uh, uh, that the place is housed you, um, so in what way, there, there's an exercise, in what way are you a manifestation of the place that you live? Um, that's very interesting. Uh, a group of people manifest a place in different ways. Uh, that's, a, that's a theme in the Alexandria Quartet. If anybody uh, hasn't read uh, Durrell's Alexandria Quartet, the first one is called Justine. Um, that's what he maintains is that all of these characters in his novel are are manifestations of the place. So uh, it, it, it was such a beautiful way to reconsider what a human being is uh, and our relationship to a city. Very, it's very interesting, uh, and I would play with that. That's a great. Uh, 
a great um, exercise. So how are we doing on time? Oh, pretty good. So any other questions or comments? I'm happy to happy to answer anything on this issue or other issues. Um, I'll try not to be gored by a buffalo in my in my bedroom here. All right. Well, um, I. Seeing that summer is coming, I urge you to get out your notebook and just um, observe and observe some more and take some time, take some time to uh, make some new observations uh, uh, for your um, sense, sense impressions uh, and give us a feeling of, of space, of place. All right. Well, thank you very much. If I don't have any other questions, I will leave you there. So have a happy Wednesday and a good week, and we'll see you next week for Writing Wednesday. Thanks.